us, a great chapter we'll continue in. So would you please welcome tonight the incomparable Don Stewart. <laughs> well, th this is going to be one of these interesting evenings because uh, today when I, I left home, I, you, know, you know how you rush around sometimes at a lunch meeting, great time, and uh, trying to get prepared everything for tonight, I had a bunch of things to throw in the car, make sure I had everything. Well, I brought everything except my um, computer and my iPad, which have all my notes on it <laughs> for my talk tonight. And so I, I, I texted my wife, I said, I think uh, all my stuff's at home because it wasn't in the car. And she said, yes, it is. And so I said, well, what should I do? And she's actually, she's perfect. She sent me a copy of a new shirt that just arrived for me today. It said this, keep calm and ask Carson to bring tea. <laughs> now, how many of you get that? Few, okay, few. few. We've got a few fans out there. All right, good. And I said, thank you, Lady, Lady Madeline. We, that I will do. Anyway, um, well, I should, I should know pretty well this, this section here, so I, I trust it'll be a blessing. You know, it was great doing that with Barry last night. We're, um, we won't finish the 10. The, um, I finished writing them, actually, and they're going to be published by Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa as a giveaway, 10 Reasons Why God Isn't Finished with Israel. And thank you for um, being there last week and encouraging that, and it was, and Barry was a real blessing with it too. So I think we've got something really, really wonderful. But what I want to do, I want to, I want to read you something here, if I can find. Here we go. That um, sort of spoke what we we talked about last week. How some people are so seemingly irrational and illogical when it comes to um, these things about what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus and about the um, the restoration of Israel and about Israel having a um, a part in the last days. This is a commentary I got, which is a, normally a fairly good commentary, and I want to just read to you uh, how they explain Acts 1-6. Now, Acts 1-6, we talked about this last week, if you recall. It says, when they actually, when they came together, therefore, they continue, actually continued to ask him, Jesus saying, Lord, if at this time, if it is at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, all right? And what we mentioned last night, of, last week, of course, is, well, that assumes what? There was going to be a restoration of the kingdom, and Jesus didn't say, what are you talking about? You're crazy. There's no kingdom there. He said, no, it's not just for you to know the times of the seasons. Um, let me read what this commentary says. This is reflective of almost most of the Christians out there in the world. Their question is whether Jesus intends to restore the kingdom to or for Israel. This may reflect the Jewish hope that God would establish his rule in such a way that the people of Israel would be freed from their enemies, especially the Romans, and established as a nation to which other peoples would be subservient. If so, all right, that's what they were asking, the disciples would appear here as representatives of those, uh, of, those of Luke's readers who had not yet realized that Jesus had transformed the Jewish hope of a kingdom of God by purging it of its nationalistic elements. In other words, the disciples hadn't realized yet that Jesus wasn't going to bring a literal kingdom back to Israel. Well, in verse 3 of Acts 1, before that, it said he'd been teaching them for 40 days. 40 days about the kingdom of God. And then right before he leaves, they ask him, is it going to happen at this time? So you don't need to know the times of the seasons. Well, according to this, uh, no, Jesus never taught that. And, and this is what we're up against, gang. This is, this is the, the, the thought processes of people literally around the world, the Christian church today in the 21st century that, like we talked about last week, the clear passages we see in Scripture of God having a future for the nation Israel are denied, denied. They're just, you know, and again, um, you know, having eyes, but they can't see. Having ears, they can't hear, I'm afraid, and so often. But anyway, just, just reading that, it just, it, 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 it saads me to see that, that uh, <clears throat> otherwise, and you know, otherwise a very good commentary on the New Testament, the book of Acts and that, but uh, in other words, they asked the question, but they were ignorant. They didn't know what they were talking about. We here do in the 21st century, they don't. Again, after spending three and a half years with Jesus and 40 days with the resurrected Christ, they're ignorant and we're not. I just, uh, I'm sorry, I, <clears throat> I'm, something's missing here, something big. All right, um, Revelation chapter 12. We're going to actually get through some of the verses uh, tonight. Uh, we had the, the introduction two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I guess it was. Then last week, going through the, uh, we got seven out of the ten reasons why God isn't finished with Israel. But we're going to just press on here, okay? Everybody got a Bible? Revelation 12, 1? Okay. It says, And a great sign appeared in the heaven or in the sky. A woman been clothed with the sun 
and the moon underneath her feet, and upon her head um, a crown of twelve stars. And she was pregnant, and she was crying out with birth pangs and being tormented to give birth. Another sign appeared in the sky or in the heaven. Behold, a, dr a dragon, great uh, red, uh, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads seven uh, diadems or kingly crowns. All right, we're going to start with just these three verses here, and, and you know we'll get through a lot more than that. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about the woman in, you know, here in verse 1, and it's very clearly a sign of the nation Israel. Um, we gave numerous reasons last week why it was. It only fits in the context. And again, in the Christian church today, there's three main beliefs. It's either the Virgin Mary, the Christian church, or Israel. Um, Mary is never spoken of as someone who was pursued by the devil you know, during this great tribulation period for three and a half years. The three and a half years uh, doesn't even fit in the time when uh, you know, Joseph and Mary went to Egypt before they went back after the, uh, the waiting for the death of Herod. Remember when the, the, the angel warned Joseph with the, the, uh, the Herod coming to kill the child, and so they t Joseph you know, awoke, took Mary by night to Egypt. That wasn't a three-and-a-half-year period. So the three-and-a-half-year period does not fit in the life of Mary. And so to make it a literal uh, referring to Mary, who did give birth to Jesus, just doesn't work. And as, like we said, uh, most Christians today, in fact, this commentary I read, believes it's the church. But the church didn't give birth to Jesus. Jesus gave birth to the church. The woman's about to have a child, a, a male, a child who's going to rule the nations. And that, of course, is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Now, remember we talked about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, then last week, how these observations, it's crucial we, we you know, know who the players are. And we said the first one, of course, the woman, um, it seems to be basically Israel. Now, she's got this crown on her head. And we notice interesting. Um, and the crown here, you know, uh, a crown of uh, 12 stars, as it were. This, the, the crown here is, is sort of a victor's crown. This is a different word than the word we're going to get to in verse 3, the diadem. This is a crown like people would often get when they, uh, you know, they won something, they achieved something. It's, it's not so much a crown like a, 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 of authority, but a crown, you know, a crown that a victor would have. And the reason we're saying this is because we're going to come to a different type of crown in the third verse. Now, it says, of course, she was pregnant and cried out uh, with birth pangs here, you know, uh, being basically tormented to give birth. Now, so that's talking about the woman. We've established how important it is that the woman equals Israel, the nation of Israel. Now, here we have in verse 3, and another sign appeared in the heaven or in the sky. Okay, so we've got a second sign. Now, remember, the first sign, we didn't want to miss this in verse uh, chapter uh, 12, verse 1. This was a great sign sign in the heaven. The second sign is not a great sign. Please don't miss this. I mean, every word's there for a purpose. The adjective great is not describing the sign, all right? This is another sign, but it's not a great one. The first one is the appearance of the nation Israel, of course. And what is the second sign? Well, another sign appeared in the heaven, and behold. All right, we've talked about this before. Whenever you see this little phrase, and behold, in your New Testament, uh, like I said, the, uh, the science of linguistics has made uh, strides light years the last 20 or 30 years. And one of the things that was discovered is this little phrase here, whenever it's used in the New Testament, when it's introducing a character, it's always introducing a main character coming on the stage. It's a, in other words, it'd be like if, if a play was going on, it was someone would, you know, uh, the lights would shine, and this person is, is going to be a main character of the play here, or the, or the drama. So whenever that happens and a character isn't introduced afterwards, this is, this is something important, something huge, something we're to pay attention to, but it's not a great sign. So it's interesting. You're to pay attention to it, but it's not the same type of sign we have here as with the woman in verse 1. All right, so it's, behold, he's called a dragon, great, you know, having a you know, great red dragon, having, a, you know, a seven heads and ten horns, and upon his head, um, heads, You've got these diadem-type crowns. Uh, English word, you know, it's probably diadems. It's different English words to try and translate it, what it is. The Greek word is diademata. For, we get diadems, the Latin word diademata, too. So the diadem speaks of a crown of rulership, a crown of authority. As opposed to the crown that the woman had, this is a crown of someone who is claiming, <clears throat> excuse me, who is claiming authority or who will try to exercise or rule with authority. Now, this is the dragon who is attempting to do that. And, of course, you can argue he's uh, the ruler of this, you know, the prince of this world right now, the ruler of, of the world as we live in this fallen world in, in some sense. It's Jesus, remember, what it was at the night of his betrayal, the prince of this world comes and finds nothing in me. So 
And so we're introduced to this character. Now, what this does here, which is real interesting, it introduces us to a personage who has been with us through all the pages of Scripture, from the third chapter of the book of Genesis all through the Old Testament to the temptation of Jesus. And now we're going to find in the book of Revelation a, a, basically a full explanation of this character, a more, the more full one. Uh, the word dragon is used of him. The word dragon is only used, in, uh, about, I think, a dozen times in the New Testament, all in the book of Revelation, and all referring to uh, uh, Satan here, the angel that became the devil. Now, he is described from us, and, and basically as we go down a few verses there, into, in verse 9, it talks about who he is. He's called, you know, he was cast down, the dragon, and notice what it says about him. Uh, the great dragon, the dragon, the great one, the serpent, the ancient serpent, the one who is called the devil, and Satan who deceives all the inhabited earth. All right, so what we finally have here is a full definition or explanation of this adversary of the Lord. And we mentioned this before, the word Satan or the word devil means the adversary. This was an angel we know from uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, as we read the context there. It, it starts talking about two human kings, the, the prince of Tyre and the king of Babylon, in these two co contexts, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. But then it goes on to describe a personage that, that wouldn't fit any type of human leader. And so you can either say, A, it's you know, the writer there you know, using you know, hyperbolic hyperbole in the language trying to you know, explain the evilness of these people, or it's talking about somebody else. And it seems to be, the best answer seems to be, it's giving us some insight into the original fall of this personage who is, as we talked about last week and, and a couple weeks before, who has been part of this great cosmic battle from the beginning. Because one of the things we're, we said in this chapter, why it's so important, the entire battle from day one, from planet Earth, from the Garden of Eden, uh, to today, to the future, to Revelation chapter 12, is based on a struggle between God and this particular personage and his army of angels, as it were. And so what we're seeing here now is a, a sort of the fullest explanation of who this person is. And again, with Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, what we see is that uh, there was this beautiful creature, this beautiful angel, who um, God had put in a position of authority, but he did something that was uh, ungodly, as it were. He did something that had never been done before. He brought a different will into the universe because before that time there was only one will, the will of God. Every creature did the will of God. But he says in Isaiah 14 five times, I will do this, I will be this, I will be like the Most High. And in doing so, he became the devil, he became the adversary by bringing a different will into the universe. And so we have that Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, we see him behind the serpent, the shining one there in the Garden of Eden. We see him in various parts of the Old Testament, but more fully revealed in the New Testament, the temptation of Jesus, the words of the Apostle Paul, uh, in the book of Acts and also in some of his letters talking about Satan or the adversary. But right now in this chapter, we, we sort of finally get, you know, an explanation of who he is. And what we see, what we see which is so important in this chapter is that this personage now who has been behind the rebellion from day one, no, not only the angelic rebellion, but behind the human rebellion against God, is now going to become front and center. So he is introduced to us. Behold, and here he comes there. Now, the explanation of, of his character, uh, you know, the seven heads and the ten horns, um, there's various ways of looking at that. We're going to um, see these same two terms later in the book of Revelation as we go into I believe in chapter 13 and that, and we'll go in a little bit bigger discussion uh, there at that particular time. But the bottom line is talking about, particularly with the diadem crowns that he have, he, it speaks of one claiming absolute authority. Now, um, as we know, Satan is a liar. Satan is a, um, you know, a deceiver and the such like. And so he has a somewhat of an authority, and God allows any authority that he does have. But here we see him appearing as one who has you know, this authoritative position. And, you know, in a sense that he does, but as we're going to see in the book of Revelation, it's very limited. So then we come to verse 4, and here's where you get the idea of Satan's uh, fall and the idea of the third of the angels. It said, his tail drag a third of the stars of the sky or the heavens and cast them unto the earth. All right, in Daniel 8.10, the stars are, are linked to angels. The stars are, you know, 
basically it's, a, it's symbolic of angels. In fact, some translation will talk about angels there instead of the stars of the sky, but it's referring to angels in Daniel 8.10. So when you see this particular verse, and here's where you get the whole idea that it seems like a third of the angels follow this character. It's, it's Revelation you know, 12.4, this verse right here, where we talk about the fall of this creature who became the devil. And you link it with Daniel 8.10, which basically in that context links angels and uh, stars. And so it seems to be that's what's uh, going on. Now, what's fascinating here, and, and reading these commentaries of Revelation, uh, usually, and most people, most commentators believe this happens here now chronologically during this time of the, uh, the Great Tribulation period, where Satan, as we're going to see, is being cast out of heaven to the earth, and this is when his tail drags this, a third of the stars at this particular time, casts them down to the earth. And so this doesn't happen until sometime in the future. Now, there, it's interesting, and I've never actually seen this point of view before, and uh, maybe Barry can comment on it because he's taught this before and I haven't, that there are a number of commentators who believe this is not talking about something future. It's talking about the original fall of Satan in the past, and also remember Jesus. And in Luke's gospel, what was it? Um, I don't remember the reference there. Luke, uh, something or other, where Jesus talks about, you know, I saw Satan fall, you know, you know from heaven. Remember the disciples came back? and as, you know, falling from heaven, and that like lightning from heaven. And so some people will argue in this particular case, this is something that's happened in the past, either speaking of the original fall of Satan or something happened during the time of Christ on earth rather than something in the future. Um, that was new to me. I hadn't thought of that before. I, I've always assumed, and I still assume in the context, that it's talking about something that's going to happen in the future, but it is interesting. There were some good commentators that took it as a, a past event, and you can read it that way, actually, too. But anyway, so what we see here, his tail, the tail of the dragon, and of course, this is, this is the serpent, the old serpent, we get it later, became the devil. He drags a third of the stars, a third of the angels with, with him, and he casts them down to the earth. Now, here's, it says, the dragon stood... Uh, in the presence of before the woman who was about to deliver, about to give birth, and in order that when she might, you know, give birth, uh, he would devour, uh, devour her child. All right, so he's waiting there to devour the child of the woman. Now, it's fascinating. We see this happen. This is not something new, is it? Uh, in the past, we've seen the enemy try and, you know, stop what God's attempting to do. You know, uh, you know uh, from the, the history of the nation Israel, keep the Messiah from being born, the slaughter of the innocents, uh, trying to destroy the promised line in the Old Testament, trying to wipe out the Jewish nation as it was. And so what we learn here is this is all motivated by this, this dragon here, trying to destroy or devour the child when he is born. And probably the initial reference would be uh, King Herod sending, you know, the soldiers there uh, after the Magi didn't come back after, you know, uh, he, he told them that Christ is born in Bethlehem, and that's why the flight to Egypt here would, would seem to, you know, explain what's going on at this particular time. Now we're told the woman gave birth to a son, okay, I gave birth to a son and who was about to rule uh, all the nations or shepherd all the nations. And so she gives birth to this son, of, and a male, a son, and it says a male child. Uh, so the, the child is a male, uh, you know, male son. It's sort of redundant there, but that's what it says. Who is about to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. All right. And so what this is doing now, this is sort of summarizing the life of the Lord Jesus This is and, and his coming the first time. This is a flashback, as it were. The woman is Israel, gives birth to the Messiah. Uh, when you know, the, the dragon's there ready to devour the Messiah, when the, uh, the, the, the king, when he is born, uh, he's the one that's promised who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron there. And, uh, and, and so the... the uh, uh, devil, as it were, is about ready to destroy him after he's born. Now, what's interesting here, we don't talk about his death, his resurrection, but the next thing it moves to is his ascension, because it's just summarizing his ministry. And what is fascinating here, he was taken up or snatched up uh, her child to God and to his throne. And the word here in Greek, of course, is the famous word harpazo, where we get the word rapture or snatched away or seized up. It is fascinating here because some people, and they've said this before mistakenly, in Acts chapter 1 when it talks about Jesus ascending into heaven, it's the same word as rapture. No, it isn't actually. It's a whole different word. He was taken up into heaven. But this is the same word here. It is describing seemingly the ascension, how he was taken up into heaven, you know, uh, snatched up in heaven or snatched up away. So in this context, it refers to Jesus being taken away. So this uh, devil now, this uh, this 
this beast, this uh, you know, entity, uh, this angel who became the devil, could not kill him. So he's taken up to God and to his throne. Now, now we move from, again, this happened you know, uh, 2,000 years ago. Now, we come, now the flashback is over. We're moving now to the future, all right? And it says, and the woman now, this is still future for us, verse 6, fled into the desert where uh, there was a place prepared for her by God in order that uh, they may feed her or take care of her there. And we've got the famous 1,260 days here, which we see over and over again. All right, so here's what's going to happen. Satan's plan from day one has been to try to thwart the plan of God. If he can do that, he would make God a liar. Because God has made promises to Abraham, to his descendants, to you and to I that are com uh, contained in Holy Scripture. If Satan can stop one of those promises from coming to pass, then God's a liar. Because he's, God's promises have to be 100% true 100% of the time. And the easiest one seemingly from a human level to stop would be to obliterate the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which promised would you know, someday have the promised line and the Messiah himself. And so what we have here in this flashback, and this is why this is so important to understand at this juncture of revelation, because with the opening here of, 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 you know, of, of all the things that are going on, like we get into the, you know, the various judgments, the seventh trumpet, the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and the bold judgments coming, it, it opens our eyes, as it were, to the cosmic battle that's been going on from day one. Now we get the explanation. Now we know what's happening. Now we know what's going on because this personage who's been behind all this is now revealed. And notice the contrast. The woman is the great sign in heaven. God came through with the nation Israel, and the Messiah was born through you know, uh, Israel, through the nation, specifically through the Virgin Mary, but through the Jewish nation, as God had been predicted. The predictions to David, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came true. That's a great sign. But another sign is the one who battled that, who tried to stop it. And what's fascinating here, the snapshot that's given us, and it goes a flashback to the past, is just the idea of somehow, you know, this uh, uh, personage, the, the devil, uh, the serpent, the dragon, as it were, is trying to destroy, trying to destroy the woman and the offspring of the woman. But what happens is, as we're told, God snatches him up into heaven before God and before the presence of his throne. And so that is the flashback of the past. And it talks about, of course, you know, the, you know this, this devil who had all these angels with him, a third of them that went with him. But now it takes us to the still future for our day, because it's going to pick up the story there and explain what he attempts to do. And we talk, and it says, the woman, and this is the woman now, is fleeing into the desert or into the wilderness. All right. When you ever read in the Bible, the wilderness, the desert, if you've been to that part of the world or seen pictures of that part of the world, it, it's not a very friendly place to be, all right? It basically is very, very difficult. The Judean desert out there, um, I never really appreciated it until I think it was my first, that was actually the first time there in Israel. I went to Jericho. And behind Jericho is the, mount, the traditional Mount of Temptation, where Jesus was tempted by the devil, whether that's where I actually went, uh, you know, somewhere in that area. And the temper, Jer, temperature at Jericho, you know, around, you know, it's the lowest city physically on earth, and the mountains behind it is hot, hot, and hotter. And there is literally hardly any shade there, hot, dry, dusty. And, you know, when I saw that for the first time, I'm thinking, no, this the Lord was tempted here 40 days trying to, you know, you know, fighting the devil here. It made me appreciate how much he went through for you and for, for me at this particular time. The wilderness is a place where there's no forgiveness, a very unforgiving land, as it were, in that time. And so Israel now goes out to the wilderness. So that would assume they're, you know, open uh, season by the Lord, you know, uh, by Satan now. He's going he's gonna to take care of them because in the wilderness there, there's really not a whole lot of places you can go. There, there's a large nation at this particular time. So it seems like they're going to be wiped out. But then it says they are fed for this 1,260 days and for a place that God will prepare for them. Now, traditionally it's been taught and believed that the place they will go to is the city of Petra in the country of Jordan. There's a passage in the Old Testament that may refer to that. Now, let me just say this. That is possible, but we've got to be careful of, you know, I've been to Petra twice and uh, each time, you know, this is the place they're going to go to. Maybe. 
it doesn't say exactly where it's going to be. It could very well be there. It could be someplace else, but it's going to be a place God has prepared for them. So God will supernaturally protect and provide for his people there during the second half of the Great Tribulation period. In other words, however he's going to do it, wherever it's going to be, he's going to supernaturally protect him. And again, we are not specifically told where. Could be Petra, uh, could, may not be. We just simply don't know. We're not told here. And so we've got to be careful about being too dogmatic here. Now, here in verse 7 is where the curtain is pulled back, all right? There was war in the sky or war in the heaven. All right, now here's one of our other characters. Remember we mentioned another major character here. Another one joins the, the crowd, Michael. Michael the archangel and his angels. Okay, he's got his own angels. Um, you know, were fighting or making war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back or made war with them. So you got two armies going on here in the sky or in the heavens in the unseen realm. Michael the archangel, Daniel 10, 13, 21, tells us he's the keeper of Israel. He is uh, an, an archangel, one of the chief princes of the Lord. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses mistakenly make Michael, the, the, you know, Jesus, the Old Testament was Michael the archangel. No, not even possible. And, G, and actually, there's some Christians that do it too, but not saying he was less than God. He was just Michael the archangel as, as an appearance of God or Christophany or, or it's called a theophany there. But no, this doesn't work because in Daniel it says Michael is one of the chief princes. Jesus isn't in a group of people. He's on his own. He's in his own you know, category, as it were. So he's not one of the chief princes. He is the chief prince. The prince of princes, the king of kings. So anyway, so we've got another angel here. So we've got this angelic battle going on. Now remember something also, too, that we read in the book of Jude. Remember the battle over the body of Moses between Michael and Satan. Now, Michael at that time would not rebuke him directly. He said, the Lord rebuke you, which is a great lesson for us. He put the Lord between himself and Satan. Michael, the powerful angel, teaches us a lesson that we're not out to rebuke the devil on our own. We're to let the Lord rebuke him, right? Well, here now, we've got an angelic battle going on. So as we get to this crucial point in the book of Revelation that, first of all, explains who the main characters are, the nation Israel, the Messiah who will come from Israel, the child, the male child who was born, the enemy here, the bad guy, as it were, the devil and his angels, probably a third of the ones that were originally created. Those are the ones, those are the two combatants here, the, good, the white hats and the black hats, the good guys and the bad guys. And now we've got a war in heaven. Now, this is where God peels back the curtain and tells us what's happening in the unseen realm. Michael and his messengers battle in some sense um, the dragon and they make war with them. Now, with respect to what happens and how this battle takes place, uh, we know from Daniel chapter 10, uh, you remember Daniel, uh, Michael said he was thwarted for coming to answer Daniel's prayer for three weeks as the prince of Persia. Uh, you know, um, this angelic figure, angelic being, thwarted him from doing it. What happens in the war in heaven? What exactly goes on? And the answer is we don't have the slightest idea what they fight. I mean, um, we're, we're in a, in a field here, gang, we just don't know. I mean, we can imagine, you know, you can think of the movies that are there, you know, you know, demons fighting each other and angels, you know, what kind of weapons they use, you know, because they don't have any physical form, so they can't, you know, blow up their body. They don't have any bodies, so I don't know. How do they fight? We don't know. There was some type of war in heaven, however they fought. Again, we don't need to know the extent of the war. You can look at all this uh, Renaissance art and that and see what it looked like, but that really is someone's imagination there. But anyway, here's the bottom line about the war in heaven. This is what we're getting to. It says... Uh, the dragon made war and his angels, but he's not able to overcome them. Neither was the place found for them in the heaven. Okay, so here's the bad news now for those on earth. He was cast down, and here's where we have the full explanation of this character. The dragon, the great dragon, the serpent, the ancient one, the one being called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives all the inhabited earth. He is cast down to the earth, the land, and his angels were cast down with him. Well... Let me tell you something, that would not be good news for those living on the earth at that particular time. Evidently, the best we can tell from Scripture, uh, they basically, they're a heavenly court. They're fighting in the heavenlies, as it were, in the unseen realm. But now it seems the access to the heavenly realm is denied them in some sense, and they're down amongst the people on the earth. Remember in Matthew 24, 21, Jesus talked about this period called the Great Tribulation, the world's never seen it before or since, what's going on here. And we're going to see as we go through the book of Revelation from now on, 
Things that in your worst nightmares, your worst dreams, you wouldn't want to be part of, you wouldn't want to see. And this is sort of setting the stage for it. It's telling us this cosmic battle that's been going on from day one, even before the universe was created, is now, instead of being in the heavenlies, it's brought down to this one planet where God actually made life, where God made human life, where God became a human being, where God set his, his place in the, in the world, particularly one nation, the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem and all that. And now the final battle, the consummation is starting to take place. But we see the participants here, but we get an insight of who it is and who's been fighting the whole time. And that is this adversary, the devil, the one who's been fighting the people of God from day one and God himself. And now they are no longer even given limited access, it seems, to heaven. They're cast down upon the earth. And so this is not the time anyone would want to be here on planet earth when something like this takes place. So anyway, they're cast down upon the earth and there's no place found for them in heaven. And now, obviously, said, I heard a you know, great voice in the heavens saying, now has become salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, because he's been cast down, the accuser of the brethren, the one who accuses them before our uh, God day and night. Now, interesting, we've got some other insights now into this character here, which we wouldn't really have known until we get to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, we're told in 1 John, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our defense attorney. He's advocating for us, and we sin. He's the go-between between us and God the Father. Well, why do we need him? Well, here we find out someone is accusing you and I day and night before God. And that is this adversary here. This is the, the one who is accusing them, the believers, day and night before the presence of our God, night and day. Now heaven's rejoicing. This guy's been thrown out once and for all. Once and for all, out of there. Now think of the career, starting, you know, it's sort of at the right hand of God, cast down from that, still with access to the heavens, and now he's been cast down to the earth when the second coming of Christ, you know, takes place. We'll get to that in about eight or nine years from now. We get to Revelation 19. <laughs> Um, remember what happened? He's cast in the abyss, the bottomless pit, and then he's released for a short time, then cast in the lake of fire. You know, his career is going south a whole particular time. But what we have here now is, the, you know, the, the, the heavens rejoicing. Their salvation and powers happen. The kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Why? Well, because this person who's been accusing God's people, you and I from day one, has been cast out now uh, bef before God, out of his presence, uh, and he's now been cast down to the earth. And so, you know, woe to those who are on the earth, because remember at this time now, there's not only the unbelievers on the earth, there's the tribulation saints, Christians, people become tribulation saints after the rapture of the church, who have become believers in Christ, who are being persecuted, many of them being martyred. You know, the martyrs were crying out, Revelation 6, 9. Uh, there's lots of these martyrs, but there's still some who are coming to faith in Christ who are, you know, who are now really under the gun because, again, if we believe, and we literally do, we not only believe there's a kingdom that's going to be restored to Israel, there's going to be a literal millennium coming where there'll be a thousand-year reign of Christ and who will populate the earth? Those who become believers to start with in bodies like you and I become believers during this great tribulation period. They're, they're going to be, uh, you know, the, 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 the tribulation saints, not the ones that are martyred, the ones who survive that enter the millennium. But you have to have them alive, too, to do that, right, to populate the millennium. So again now, with Satan and his armies, his minions, all here on the earth, can you imagine how difficult it would be to be a believer in Christ at this particular time? Because what he's attempting to do before Christ comes back the second time is make the word of God untrue by wiping out every single Christian. He's going to wipe out a lot of them, but every single one on the face of the earth. And so he's cast down to the earth right now. The heavens are rejoicing, but I don't think the believers on earth are that happy at this particular time, the ones who become believers during this great period. And verse 11 is one of the greatest verses of all the Bible. It says, and they overcame him through the blood of the lamb and through the word of their testimony. Um, and then it says this, they did not love their own lives unto the point of death. That's something amazing. They didn't love their own lives unto the point of death. Now, these are heroic individuals at this particular time. And it's only the grace of God that allows it. Every once in a while, we get a question on the radio that says, wait a minute now. 
uh, these guys could have heard the gospel before, otherwise they'd be getting a second chance. No, it's, it's different. God, you know, once you die, you don't have another chance. But while you're alive, you know, God doesn't preach the gospel to you once and that's it. Thankfully, right? How many times do we have to hear over and over again, maybe years and years, people talking at us, uh, you, know, you know, pleading for us to come to Christ. And finally, the grace of God, you know, by the grace of God, we became believers. Well, these people here, whether they heard the gospel before, whether they knew Christians, whether they were, you know, family members of Christians, they heard the truth. They knew the truth. Uh, for the most part, probably, and yet when the Christians left the world, they realized what we were saying is true, and by God's grace, they turned to Christ, refused the mark of the beast we're going to see in the next chapter, but they became, you know, the targets now of not only the unbelievers here on the earth that were, satan you know, that are satanically filled with rage, fighting, shaking their hands against the Lamb, but also the targets now of this angelic group that comes to the earth, these fallen angels and Satan, they're now on the earth. And again, just try and imagine how difficult it must be. And of course, we see the martyrdom continues to take place. But we see something else happen here. And this is something that's, that's wonderful. We see that God giving, gives us the strength to these believers to become martyrs for Christ and gives them the strength, you know, where they don't even love their own lives to the very end. And it's an amazing thing. Uh, hearing the stories year after year, year after year of Christians who go off to places where the gospel is not heard in some senses, but where the gospel is, you know, hated, and people who take a stand for Christ literally are, are you know, risking their lives. And hearing the stories of people who have come to Christ uh, and then who go out to the mission field and end up giving their life for Christ on the mission field, but they willingly do it. They do it because the love of Christ guided them to do something like that. They're not crazy people. They're not religious fanatics. They're not insane. They had something guiding them. And then when they're about to die, you know, they, they do it with the grace of God. When I was um, going to Bible college, I might have told you the story before, but forgive me, but it, it's really worth telling at this particular point. We had a, in, in our English, of all classes, Christian school, English class one day, we got into a discussion about death and dying. I don't know how we got into it. And we had one student there who um, uh, gave, us t gave a testimony to us, never forgotten. He was older than the rest of us. He was probably in his, you know, we're young college kids in our early 20s. He was probably his late, late 20s, 27, 28, 29. And he'd been in Vietnam. He'd, and he said, I want to just tell you something. He said, I was a medic in Vietnam. And he said, as a medic, I watched many people die in my arms. And he said, if nothing else would ever convince me that God was true, that Jesus was the Son of God, it was watching Christians die and was watching non-Christians die. He said, it was all the difference in the world. He said, they're all in pain. They're all hurting physically. But there is a grace, a peace upon the Christians, talking about going home, talking about seeing the Lord, something that you could not explain naturally. He said, when I was trying to, you know, save unbelievers who were dying, they would curse, they would scream, they would yell, they would want any, try to get any last breath. And he said, if nothing else ever would convince me there's a God, it's again, watching the Christian die, watching the non-Christian die. The grace of God that's there, he gives us supernaturally the strength. You know, many of us are watching the things going on today in the uh, Middle East with this Islamic State uh, barbaric group, you know, putting to death Christians. Um, and wondering, wow, is that ever going to happen here? And could I, what, what, how would I feel? How would I respond to something like that? Well, I don't think any of us know, but at the time, God gives a special grace to people, a special ability, a peace that's there that passes understanding. And we have a little a testimony of this still to come in the future. Because if any group, again, as we're going into this, as we're moving into Revelation towards, you know, consummation of, of, of life here on earth, if any group needed the grace of God, it is these people who became Christians during this period who had the hatred of this person we're going to meet in the next chapter, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the unbelievers on the earth, the ones shaking their fists at the Lamb of God. If that isn't bad enough, it's also these angelic figures who are on the earth too, um, who are also you know, you know, supernaturally uh, energizing people to try and kill those who have believed in Jesus. So it's quite a passage here, but it also speaks, I believe, of all the martyrs that have died for the cause of Christ from, uh, from day one. Now, we usually think the martyrs, the people who have died for Christ, it was, you know, the early Christians, the first couple centuries, and that's true. That's true. But what, one of the mind-boggling things that I learned 
going to Bible school, going to a lot of mind-boggling things, but from our missionary teacher, Dr. Quast, he said this. He said, you realize, this is, you know, 19, what, 73, 74, that more Christians have been martyred for their faith in the 20th century, given their life for Christ in the 20th century, than the first 19 centuries combined. More Christians were killed for their testimony of Christ. Now, if we read Revelation correctly, and we realize that, you know, we know the world population, what's going to be, and what's going to take place, is a pretty good guess that the people that die as martyrs during the Great Tribulation will probably outnumber those that have died in the history from the time of Christ up until the present with the, with the persecution that's there. And we will meet, again, those martyrs later in, when they're raised in Revelation chapter 20. But the point is simply this. This is a horrific, horrific, horrific time to be on the face of the earth. Yes, these people get in, but I think it's, I, I want to use the word unimaginable, and I, I, you know, I wish I had a better adjective, unimaginable how it must be to try and survive during this time. And so if anybody hears the gospel message, if anybody's here tonight and thinking, well, I'll wait to that time to be a believer in Christ, I give you a strong suggestion. Don't wait. Now is the day of salvation. You don't want to wait for something like that. For one thing, you may never get to that, right? But it, it's uh, when, we, when it starts hitting us, what's going on here? What these people will put up with? Um, thank God for his grace. Thank God for the, you know, the blessed hope. See why the rapture is called the blessed hope? <laughs> yeah, so we don't like one of my um, Bible teachers, Dr. Charles Feinberg. He was a uh, atheist Jewish person going to you know s a school became a believer in Christ as a Jew became a world-class Christian theologian teacher was the Dean of Talbot Seminary and he had a couple great lines he said uh, you know uh, you know the blessed hope is not are not the judgments coming of Revelation 6 through 18 that's not what we're looking forward to and that is so true the blessed hope is escaping them 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it talks about he's going to have us, he's going to, you know, uh, basically take us or snatch us away, protect us, free us from the coming wrath. And because he's not appointed us to wrath, but through salvation in Jesus Christ. But it's rather sobering to think of the future of both believers and unbelievers, the ones that are left behind. The, ones, the left behind ones will all start out being unbelievers, but believers will, will start showing up. But what they will have to go through is something none of us, and hopefully by God's grace, it won't be any of us, we already know where we're going, will be there at that particular time. So these verses here are, are, are incredible because what it does, it sets the stage for not only what's going to happen in the rest of Revelation, but Revelation 12 basically tells us about the whole battle that's been going on day one. It's almost like, okay, now you've read the Bible up until this point. Now we're going to give you, we're going to start, you know, kind of filling the blanks in and tell you who these participants have been, give you a little bit more explanation, the old serpent, the devil, this and that. So now we get an idea of what's been happening from day one, where it hits a crescendo now, and then literally from 12 on, it's going to go down, down, down as the judgments continue. And so, uh, that is Revelation chapter 12. That's all the time I have tonight. We'll get Barry up here, but it's amazing, isn't it? The things we read and we see in this fabulous chapter that we believe is probably the, pin the pivotal, if not one of the most important, the most important chapters in the book of Revelation. Because if we understand this, then we understand the battle that's been going on from day one, uh, who the participants are, where everything fits in, and how you can tell the players here, thank you, with the, uh, with the proper scorecard. All right, Mr. Barry. Welcome, pa oh, not it's Dave, we don't welcome him. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, well, again, you if too. you're listening or watching online and you have a question, you can email it to mediaroom at cctustin.org and uh, we'll get that uh, spoken to us up here on the stage. And Don, you brought up a couple of things that really, I think, uh, are interesting in the light of some of the things that are being taught today. One of them being, it seems to be, getting some traction too, that if someone has heard the gospel prior to the rapture of the church yeah. and they refuse the gospel or reject the yeah. gospel at that time, it is impossible for them yeah, to, to be saved yeah. during the tribulation period. Um, can you maybe... Testing. <laughs> yeah, it's still working. Uh, there we go. I can hold this. Just hold it. Go ahead. Can you maybe uh, expound on that a little bit if that chair will cooperate? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's getting taller or what's it doing. What's the yeah, chair? Yeah, I don't know. They're getting taller. You have my I chair and I have your here. chair. Is that it? <laughs> I'm going to ring Carson and ask for some tea. I need some tea right now. I'll just make it easier. All right. 
Uh, there we go. What is, what is this? Feel, hey, this is the king's chair. All right. You're giving me the first seat. I, uh, you know, okay, anyway. Um, yeah. Um, this is one of the, this is, what was the question again? I don't, I don't even remember. What are we I'm talking just, about? About the size if of the chair. If a person chairs, has heard okay, the gospel yeah, and yeah. rejected the gospel, can they still be saved during yeah, the tribulation? Yeah, of course they can. They, they, they use the uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two verses like ten and following passage about those. You know, uh, there'll be a spirit of delusion, strong spirit of error sent to them. But it, it's talking about a certain class of people who, who don't, who haven't believed, but also who love iniquity, who who rejoice in lawlessness. Not just the regular garden variety unbeliever, but unbelievers who take pleasure. That's what it says, take pleasure in wickedness, as it were. So no, um, they've got to come from somewhere. And you think about it, Barry, maybe this would have made sense. I first heard it like 40 years ago. Uh, the guy came, there was a guy who came to Calvary, taught a prophecy thing, and he said this, there won't be any second chance for those who have already heard the gospel after the rapture of the church comes. That really threw people for a loop there. I remember that. I remember it very clearly. Now, you could understand it possibly to a degree then, but here now... Uh, for example, Barry and I tomorrow will be on his channel. We'll be sitting there, you know, in this room looking at these, these you know, uh, cameras. He looking at one, I'm looking at another one, and talking for an hour together. And we'll be watched by untold number of people around the world, Christians and non-Christians alike. So uh, it's going to get to a place, and also Revelation 14, 6, there's an angel who's going to preach the everlasting gospel. We're going to get to that at that time. But the world is being evangelized right now with the technology that's there. And so... I, the unbelievers got to, the believers got to come from somewhere, right? Not just people who've never heard. Well, and if there's the massive numbers that are being saved during the tribulation, I mean, again, you know, as you mentioned, with the technology, there's very few people, unlike maybe even a century ago or half a century ago, that haven't been exposed to the gospel to some degree. So, you know, that's, um, you know, one of the, I think one of the major problems with that particular understanding is why would that be true during the tribulation and it's not true now? Yeah, exactly. I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, how many got saved the first time they heard the gospel? You know, why are we told that some plant seeds and others water and God gives the increase? So again, I think that's gonna be consistent during the tribulation that some things that people heard, I think there's gonna be a lot of folks that were uh, maybe church attendees and actually weren't born again that'll get saved during the tribulation. Um, Matter of fact, I think that's going to be probably a major uh, source of those who come to know Christ or those who had a form of godliness but uh, denied the power, which is the gospel. One other thing, Don, that popped into my head while you were talking, especially about you know, Satan being cast down and all the various interpretations of that, one of the interesting things that I've read over the years, I haven't come across it too frequently, but a couple of times I've run across someone, uh, a commentator who's reporting that, if you look back in the history of Israel, there was not this, you know, the nation of Israel and as God directed them, there isn't a huge record of uh, just people being demonically possessed and all these other things. But when it came time for the Messiah, that all of these demonic manifestations began to present themselves and people were possessed and all the things we see in the ministry of Jesus. And now here we are seeing that same thing and exactly. I think if you kind of work that out to its natural end, if the demonic realm is becoming increasingly active as it did the first time Jesus came, I think we can assume that he's about yeah. to come again. Yeah. So yeah. kind the of an interesting perspective. No, it's right, and that's, that's been mentioned before. You're right, you don't see it too often, but the point is this, the demonic activity was, was there, but nothing like the time when the Lord came the first time and it's gonna be ramped up again, which is the things we read in the book of Revelation of that. And the fact that we're, we're seeing more and more of this today, we're seeing things, uh, demonic things, barbaric. Now that these things have always happened, but now they're out in the open, these barbarisms that are there, which seems to be another sign that we're getting close to the end, agreed. Well, and the violence too, I mm. mean, just the level of it and yeah. the barbaric nature of it and the actions of ISIS. I mean, this is demonic is all it is. Totally. It's nothing more and uh, you know, to see the treatment of people, burning people alive especially, I think is just heinous beyond anything else. I mean, just knowing what a torturous death that is and to trap children and yep. all the other things that we've been seeing and to execute them. And now we've got stories. Did you hear that story about them selling vials of blood 
No. Um, ISIS is draining the blood of the people they're capturing, and, no, and there's really. something ritual associated with that. But just obviously, the devil has to be behind these things. And uh, yeah. I think we're just seeing more and more evidence that uh, the Lord is about to come for his bride. Yeah. Today would be good. Yeah. Yeah. We can and handle that. that. Yeah. We have a question. Right? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, Revelations 12, 8, and 9. Um, being that Satan and his angels were cast down, does he still have access to heaven to accuse the brethren now? Or was he per permanently denied access to heaven when he was cast out and took a third of the angels with him? Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. There was no more opportunity and, uh, you know, Don mentioned the fact that there are some commentators who see this casting down as the initial fall of Satan, the dragging of a third of the angels with him. And I think there's good reason to maybe see it as both. It's pointing back and it's pointing forward because there is a time where Satan was cast down, if you will. He fell. Uh, he was you know, perfect in wisdom and beauty. Uh, he became apostate or perverted or however you want to uh, phrase it. And then also we see this final casting down of heaven where he no longer has access to uh, accuse the brethren yeah. night and day before the Lord. One of the things we mentioned a few weeks ago on, uh, on Sunday in one of the Psalms we were, we were looking at is I think we need to remember Satan doesn't need to make up stuff about us to accuse us before <laughs> God. All he has to do is tell God the truth yeah. and therefore uh, yeah. we have an advocate with the Father, thankfully, Jesus Christ the righteous. Done. Yeah, no, yeah, any longer, so it assumes they, they were there, and if it's if still the future, the, the accusing of us, that's why we need the advocate, right now happens day and night, and as, as Barry said, it's not that he has to make up stuff, we give him plenty of fodder, don't we, to, for to being <laughs> accused, and these are believers, you know, these are us, we, we still, that's why, you know, it says we have the advocate, First John 2, one with the righteous, even Jesus Christ, who is our advocate, our defense attorney, but we do sin. We, you know, he will. You know, that's why we confess. And so, yeah, he's, he is still there. He's working big time there. Uh, he was thwarting the ministry of the apostle Paul. Remember, Satan hindered him doing this. So there's no evidence that Satan was inactive uh, sometime during the time after Jesus, you know, died, rose again, ascended to heaven. The Book of Acts certainly shows his activity. That Paul's writings do, and Revelation also gives us further insight into it. There's mention of Satan, different manifestations. I mean, he's an angel, he's a serpent, he's a dragon. I mean, all these characters or all these manifestations, what's going on here? I mean, what, where does you know, a dragon come from? That it looks like a snake or what? And was he literally a snake or he from an angel he became a snake or what, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, I think the purpose of the, yeah. the language here was just to clarify Old Testament references yes. to the same personage. You know, because he's described according to the various attributes. And some of them are descriptive. There's some who believe that, you know, because the Bible seems to indicate that there is a creature that does breathe fire, uh, that, you know, the, the dragon description was common. And that was probably the form that he took until he was made to crawl on his belly the rest of his days. So, you know, but I think the main purpose here is just to point back to other terms used to describe the devil. You know, some have made the case that there's some 29 different descriptions of the Antichrist yes. throughout the Bible. So, you know, I think that's basically the same thing, just to bring clarity to who exactly is in view here that was cast out of heaven, not so, necessarily to make an attachment to so any one of the So does he have power to change? No. No. It had nothing no. to do with what he looks like. No, I think it's a lot no. to do, uh, you know, just like the Lord is uh, described yeah. as, you know, he's got feathers and we hide under his wings. Well, mm. we know he doesn't. And, uh, you know, that's just a figurative language to give us something to relate to. And I think that's the same case here. Yeah, describing so, his character, like the ravening, roaring lion in First Peter chapter 5. He's not a lion. He's not a, uh, a dragon. He's not a you know, an angel, as it were, who he is, he's a personage, a being, well, he's not an angel of the Lord, angel of darkness, but angel just means messenger, but he has no physical form, but these, these are 
explanations of his character, his person, so we can best understand who our adversary is in terms, you know, like, like Barry said, the dragon, the fire-breathing creature, the, the slithering snake. Most people don't like snakes, right? Uh, you think of a, a roaring lion uh, uh, evokes fear in us. And so the different analogies, and he's right, something like 33 different, um, different analogies of this man of sin, this antichrist that's coming on the Bible gives. So we can have an understanding of his character, his person. That's what he looks like. Because he has no physical form, he can, you know, um, he's he's spirit being, as it were, and so, you know, like, like God, he's, you know, he's a spirit being that doesn't have any corporeal form. But this explains the best we can understand who he is. And looking at what the text actually says, the devil is diabolos, which is a Greek term, which yep. means the accuser or false accuser, and um, yep. Satan is an Aramaic term, which means the accuser as well. So, you know, we're just, I think the Lord is just wanting us to make sure we know who's getting thrown out here. <laughs> yeah, the slander, yeah. Uh, talks about uh, Satan with the ten horns. And I was wondering, is that the same uh, as the ten toes on the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his, in his dream? And do, do people still hold to, to the theory that the ten horns are actually the ten countries of the European common, common market? Has that gone away? Well, the common market's gone away. European Union's the new new flavor of the week, isn't it, the last, what, 25 years or so? Yeah. But do you equate the ten horns with the ten toes, the ten kings, there and three are, you know, deposed? You know, there's, yeah, I think there's a relation there, obviously, you know, because you have to track back to Daniel in most mm -hmm. of these, you know, uh, yeah. indications that were given here, the kings and the horns, and there's like language and all that, you know, so there's various interpretations. One, I think it's interesting that the Ten Toes and Daniel tell us that there is some type of coalition yeah. that's formed. And it's not completely the Roman Empire because it's iron mingled with clay. And so it's a very loose coalition right. because, you know, iron and clay aren't going to adhere to one another. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a weak coalition, if you will, but it's, it's spearheaded by those iron legs that are representative of, of the Roman Empire. You know, some talk, uh, interpret this, this dragon that has seven heads. Some, and maybe you can add a little bit to this, Don. Some see this as the, uh, since we're talking about the whole of the history of the nation of Israel, some see this as the seven nations that have persecuted Israel throughout their history, beginning with the Egyptians and the Assyrians, then the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians and the Greeks, then the Roman Empire, both in two forms, the first and then the second form, you know, which is, <laughs> like the fourth beast that is like no yep. other in, in the book of Daniel. So, you know, there's various interpretations yep. and various ways to see it. Yeah, and I also read somewhere that the seven, the seven crowns are seven, actually seven hills of, of Rome. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they got that combined. That's how they, I, I think that's how they came with the theory of, of uh, the, the, the next Roman Empire right. because of the seven hills of Rome. And they equate the seven crowns with that. I don't know. It's, you know, people bring touch up all on kinds that. of stuff. It's, I mean. Yeah, it's 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 not. There's a lot of different pop possibilities. It's not that clear. And like Barry mentioned, some believe it's the seven enemies, the seven kingdoms that have opposed Israel. That's one of the points of view. Some it's you know, I don't know. I, that's why I didn't say anything about. It. I'm not really sure. Yeah, and it you know you've got the seven hills. Yeah. The city that sits on seven hills. You know, there's multiple cities that are described as the city of seven hills. Rome being one. Yeah. Istanbul being another. And I think that's interesting that those are the two capitals of the Roman Empire, which yep. gives pretty East sound West, that evidence that, you know, this is going to be, you know, some type of formation of the old Roman Empire, which is consistent with that of Daniel II, the ten-toed uh, statue. I just wanted to say, Pastor Don, you said you didn't have your notes tonight, and you really did a good job without oh, thank your you. notes. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. Wasn't it? <laughs> Maybe I don't lose them every time. So, uh. No, it was excellent. <laughs> and also, Pastor's perspective today was really good. Well, thank you, really Carolyn. Thank that. you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Well, and I good. wanted, last uh, Thursday night, you mentioned the fact that you said ISIS you thought was a blip on the radar. Definitely. I just wondered what you thought was going to happen with them. Well, yeah, uh, we developed a little bit last week. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow. This article, like we should mention to get a chance, please read it. In the Atlantic Magazine, a man named... Um, Graham, what's his name? Graham Wood, is that it? Uh, I think that's his name. Um, this month's Atlantic Magazine explains, it's about a 30 minute read of ISIS, what's going on. The point is, it's very clear, ISIS, the Islamic State, 
is a, attempting to establish a caliphate right here. That means a, a, what they cannot recognize any other nation, they can't join any other nation, anybody tries to vote with another nation, even an Islamic person, they're put to death, because they are the kingdom, Allah's kingdom on the earth. The Iranians are um, Shia Muslims, these are Sunnis, and they're arch enemies. According to Ezekiel 38, it's the, the Shia Muslims that come down with the great army with the power of the authority. So by definition, that would seem to mean this ISIS is just a blip on the radar screen. They're here, but they're not going to last. Barry, your thoughts? Well, I think it, it, the article is great. It's, it's a worth, worthwhile read, yeah. and it gives us a little more backdrop of exactly why they're so aggressive on yeah. taking land. They have to have land in order for a uh, not just the caliphate, but also the caliph to take control and there is you know islam demands that there be one person who is just like muhammad was you know who is over islam as a whole and they have to have land to rule over it or invalidates you know their office so they're trying to hang on to land in order to establish the caliphate for the caliph to rule over otherwise there's really nothing for him to do and he's basically exposed as a fraud so it's very important for them to keep uh, uh, baghdadi uh, yep. up on the screen, so to speak. But, you know, again, the whole unraveling has to take place. That's one thing I think we need to recognize about uh, the time of the Great Tribulation, that there is a single religious system that dominates the world, and that, therefore, is going to require the world's two major religions, if not, you know, major in the sense of theology, but major in the sense of numbers, to basically be disassembled. And I think that's what's going to happen with the rapture of the church. And I think that's what's going to happen when Islam unravels. I think it has to. Now, it is curious. I've always found it curious that the practice uh, of execution during the tribulation is beheading. And that that now has been introduced into, you know, normal speak. I mean, we see it and it happens all the time. And it's even videoed and presented to people to watch, you know. So, you know, it's kind of be getting normalized already. Uh, at least in the minds of people. So, you know, those who are with the Antichrist, are, yeah, just cut their heads off. They're against the system. They're against, you know, global peace and all the other things. So, you know, I don't know that that necessarily demands no, that Islam no. is doing the cutting off of the heads. No, great question. Yeah, not at all. So the idea is Iran and Islamic State are mortal enemies. They're fighting each other. According to Ezekiel 38, Iran's got the army, Iran's got the power, Iran's got the munitions. That means these other people aren't, aren't there. They're gone. And so somehow they will be destroyed and become non-existent. And like Barry said, Baghdadi is supposed to be this caliph, the final ruler there, and he gets knocked off. Uh, and again, they can't join with any other nation, any other Islamic nation. They have to conquer all these people. Saudi Arabia, they got to conquer Egypt, got to conquer, you know, Jordan, Syria, uh, the rest of Iraq. They're not going to be able to do that. They're, 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 they're well financed and, and fairly large, but not compared to what's in the area there. And so um, they're a blip, a big time. Well, the article also says, you know, one of the reasons that they're killing other Muslims is because according to Islam, there's only one law, and that's right. Sharia law. And if you recognize any other type of governmental exactly. system, or if you even are willing to operate under it, then you're apostate, and therefore you are deemed to be executed yep. according to fundamental Islam, and that there can only be one ruler and there can only be one law, and it's Sharia law, yep. and everything else is, uh, makes you an infidel if you follow after or fall under any governmental system. True. Billy, you're up. Well, hi, fellas. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> This is a fundamental thing. It might help somebody out there who's not heard it or has heard it. In Matthew 26, 42, you remember Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He cried out, not my will, but your will. And then the next day while he's on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, we know that Jesus never sinned, but the teaching is that God cannot look upon sin and that uh, God the Father turned away because he couldn't look upon sin because Jesus had just taken all the sins of the world upon him. Well, uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 reads, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. And so this person challenged the fact that 
that that had nothing to do with cry, Jesus crying out, oh, my God, my God, that uh, God uh, did look upon Jesus. And uh, anyway, clarification, that's what uh, I'm seeking for those who are wondering about that. You don't want that? No. <laughs> it's your turn. Should I withdraw? No, 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 the chosen people of God. That's why the sin of one would impact others. When David took a census, others died for that. You know. So again, God is talking about, when he's talking about the nation of Israel, turning his face from them, he's not going to look on them with favor anymore. And so therefore, you know, the face, and this is one of the things we'll talk about on Sunday, the face, and we talked about this last week too, now that I think about it, the face speaks of one's character, one's nature, one's countenance, and God is saying, my countenance toward you is going to change because of your iniquity. And therefore, I'm going to deal with you differently, though you know, you're not going to forfeit being my chosen people, but you are going to experience the consequences of the loss of my favor. So you know, I don't think we can look at this as saying God, otherwise we'd have to say God is basically eliminating Israel as his chosen people because of their sin, and that it becomes problematic for us as Christians as well. Well, who is in sin and he hasn't confessed the sin yet. Uh, and, you know, John says, if you are faithful to confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from unrighteousness. And so he can't have fellowship with you if you're in sin and you're not confessing. That's the equation that I have to this question. Therefore, if I sin, does God turn away because he cannot have fellowship with sin? And uh, with Jesus Christ on the cross, took the sins of the world, and then God the Father. You know, so that's kind of a thin line, and I'm hoping you guys can kind of... Come Sunday morning, Billy. <laughs> Barry will answer all those questions, right? Yeah, again, I think well, the issue just, is more just, of intimacy, you know, because David, when David had sinned greatly against the Lord, yes. you know, just like with we as Christians today, David said, my vitality left me. Yes. He said, your hand was heavy upon me. Yes. And so that tells us that God is still interacting with his creation, but he's, or his children, but he's interacting in a different way. He's interacting in a sense of discipline. And this is what David was talking about. And then David said, as soon as I confess my sin, as soon as I acknowledge my iniquity, everything turned around. Right. Everything began right. to change. Okay. So the fact that God was still pressing down on David showed us yes. that God had not drawn his attention away completely from David. Well, uh, he was just dealing with him differently. Don, uh, I'm out of town, and where I'm going to be is where I was last Sunday when this challenge came, so I'll have to get there. <laughs> well, you, get, get, get. you listen online, that's all right. <laughs> the technology will allow that to happen. Yes, yes. All right, let's all stand. Father, again, we're so thankful for your word, and thank you for that which we learned here tonight, God. And again, as we ask every week, Lord, may this stir us up to love and good works, especially the good work of preaching the gospel. And help us to go out in this uh, delusional world today and speak the truth in love, and do so so that others might be saved. And God, use us for your glory in all things. We ask it in Jesus' name, and all God's Wednesday night warriors said, Amen. I found the answers you need. Are you listening? I'll tell you the truth about God. My eyes haven't seen him, and these hands never touched him. I've never seen the wind, but I.